Hi, I'm Johan Amskov, and I'm here at Go to Copenhagen for Go to Unscripted. I'm a software engineer at Uber, and uh, I'm here today with uh, Felix, and I'm looking forward to having a great conversation with you. Yeah. So, could you say a few words about yourself? Looking forward also. I'm Felix, um, also software engineer. Recently, been doing some privacy security work and also some uh, quantified self work. So, I'm all over the place. I don't really have an official title at the moment. So, I'm still experimenting, changing it every week on LinkedIn and seeing, you know, what people like the most. Um, but yeah, originally software engineer, and that's what I uh, truly like doing. Nice. You say uh, quantified self, and when uh, we got invited to speak together. Of course, I tried to figure out who is this uh, Felix fella, and I stumbled on uh, how is Felix that today, which is uh, I, su I su suppose this uh, quantified self where you basically publish yeah. uh, tons of information about yourself. Could you uh, tell a bit about that project then? Yeah, it all started super randomly. Initially, I uh, faced a problem. Uh, I was moving. I, I moved to America, and I visited back home in Austria quite often. And uh, my friends in Austria would often text me like, hey, Felix, when are you back in town? Like, let's hang out. And I felt like I always send my travel schedule via like Messenger. So I figured, okay, let's just buy, like, let's just buy a domain and call it where is Felix that today? So not how is Felix back then, but where is Felix that today? And all it did, it was showing my travel schedule. So it was showing like, oh, I'm flying back to Austria in like December or something. Um, and it was a joke, obviously. And I sent it to friends and they loved it because it was so uh, funny, ridiculous, right? Like, it didn't make sense. And um, it kind of grew from there. So it was initially just my travel schedule, and then I was already tracking my mood. Uh, so I show my mood on that website, and then I was measuring my weight, so I added my weight on there. And now, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the website yet, so now it's How is Felix Today, and it includes like, uh, I think it's like 45 graphs about my life, everything from like the number of steps over time, or like correlations between alcohol and headache, for example, who would have thought uh, the next day, and um, all these kind of things. And I decided to do all of this uh, to the public. Um, so that's kind of like my quantified self project. It's, uh, it's very fun to look in there and uh, you also have some few analyses and of course we love graphs. Uh, and one thing that, at least in many organizations I've been in, people love measuring stuff. And if they can get a dashboard, like they already mm -hmm. find that to be a win. Yes. Uh, and one of my pet peeves is like you shouldn't really measure or visualize stuff if you don't intend to act on it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so do you have? Is there anything where you just like, this is a surprising finding. Let me do something different that came out of this project or. Not too many, to be honest. I have to admit, uh, the problem is that life is so complex that even if you quantify and track everything, realistically, you just don't have enough data. So the simplified statement here is that I was tracking my data for around three years with no interruptions. But even then, you end up with around 1,000 days. Then when you want to look into correlations, you would have to exclude all the days where you are sick, for example. Or you need to exclude the days where you are flying somewhere and have a jet lag, right? Like Obviously, those days are different than normal days. And what ends up happening is that you actually end up having a very low number of days that are actually meaningful for finding correlations and trends. So the only solution would be to have more years but then also life is short, so you don't have a lot of more years. Um, or the other solution would be to have more people join it, but then you end up with like a, what is it called, like medical study, uh, or like a, uh, I forgot what it's called, but yeah. That, then it would also defeat the purpose, because then it's not about you, but about humans as a whole. So that, that's a whole different project. Yes, and we don't yeah. want to introduce AI. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, what was your experience here with the, with the graphs at work, as in building a, dashboard and then you didn't want to act on it or you didn't act on it? No, I think, uh, so I've been a consultant in the DevOps sphere for quite some time being around in many different organizations. And one of the strong things that we can do as engineers is that we can actually build stuff and we can generate data. We can actually not just argue, we can try to show some things. Okay. And then when we show graphs to 
uh, let's just say the stereotypical manager, they go like, ooh, this graph goes up or goes down, and we also need to measure uh, this metric and uh, this metric, how many deploys do we have, how many bugs are there, well, mm -hmm. whatever we might uh, come up in our, the madness of our, our minds. There's so many different things that we can measure, and then we end up with graphs that are up on large screens in our uh, open office, right? Radiating, uh, going up and going down, and no one ever looks at them. Mm -hmm. Right? So that kind of defeats the purpose of measuring, or like at least the purpose of visualizing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, one thing is acting, right? But the other thing is also, is it actually meaningful to track it, right? I, I would feel like something like maybe tracking the backlog could be something where at first it makes sense to track the number of open to-dos, right? But then when you think about large software projects, there's also unlimited, right? There's always unlimited to-dos. Yes. So is it meaningful to track a burn-down chart of the backlog? Maybe not, right? Maybe you have to do it for the, what is it, P0s, P1s. It makes sense to have a burn-down chart. But yeah, it's probably the same, right? Like yes. one is the acting, one is the, does it actually make sense to visualize and So I, I think they're very tightly connected because if it makes sense, mm. so for, we can have two different ways. And I think especially in uh, big tech companies, we do have a sense of alerting or things like that. Mm -hmm. But in many traditional companies, maybe we're more focused on actually the visualization and the human capability to spot trends, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And if I'm visualizing something that we continuously monitor as humans, mm -hmm. but I don't have any action mm -hmm. that I expect to be taking based on whether mm -hmm. this metric goes up or down, whatever mm -hmm. it is, like what is my action if the number of backlog items increase? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? We can have a sense of that. Does that mean we close more tickets or mm -hmm. do we hire more, move more people to the, uh, to the team? What is like the set of actions that we can take if this goes in, in the direction we don't want it to go in? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. if we don't have that, then maybe it doesn't make sense to at least visualize because I'm all for overgathering information, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't know when everything breaks, mm -hmm. what are we going to need, mm -hmm. right? We don't know that up front. Mm -hmm. We have all been there where after something broke, we added more metrics, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. then next time it breaks, yeah. we have more insights. But that doesn't mean that we need to promote those metrics to an alerting series or main dashboard visualization on our board. And I think that's <clears throat> when we become aware of the actions that we're having. That's when we concretely say, when this metric does this, mm -hmm. if nothing else, I want to be notified such that I can figure out why did it go like mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. And I think we have an over tendency to just put nice graphs up because then the the system feels alive, mm -hmm. or, but it's just nice. And also, I think with the graphs that look nice, they're also sometimes necessary, I think, for us as engineers. So I feel like you may work on a project, and you know that this one step is like slow or inefficient or whatever it is. And now you go to your manager, right, and you say, like, hey, we should improve this. Like, at large companies especially, right, you need some facts or graphs or numbers, right, to show that. that. And so my experience, it was always like, uh, I remember one thing was at Apple, they had, when you upload a binary for the App Store, they were doing some processing. In the beginning, it was like a half a minute thing. It was totally fine, half, wait half a minute, and then the binary is ready. Over time, they added more and more checks, and they added more and more stuff that is happening, like bit code and verification and so on. And it ended up that depending on the time of the day, it took up to an hour, right? And that was not acceptable for many engineers. But Apple internally back then didn't really care. They didn't know the problem because they also don't use their own system, right? Because they don't build their own apps through their own app store. And so one project that I worked on was very simple, which was raise awareness on the processing time of binaries. That was many, many years ago. It's all resolved now. But raising awareness, basically introducing a hashtag on Twitter it was like iOS processing time or something. And in Fastlane, while it was waiting, uh, so Fastlane was the project that I worked on, mobile developer tool. So while it was waiting for the binary to show up, it was telling us like, hey, like, if you're interested, you can tweet this text. I was like sending, showing you the text, like, uh, I was processing time 60 minutes. And so you could just copy and paste that and tweet that. And people did that. People really liked that. And I think it actually helped engineers at Apple to go to their manager and say like, hey, look, there's a hashtag about the system that we are operating. And people kind of make fun that it's so slow. Like, we should probably improve that. And I think, uh, I don't know if you also had some experience there, but I think it's one of these powerful tools that you can use to uh, get work done at, uh, yeah, with, with your team and with your manager. Yes. And like, there's also the, the dashboard can be, uh, let's call it a defensive dashboard. Like, uh, as engineers, we 
get interrupted a lot mm-hmm. on Slack on and and you had the perfect example right people kept asking you when are you going to be uh, be home so mm-hmm. you you put up a dashboard mm-hmm. where your stakeholders could see <laughs> sure yeah it's a good way to put when, it when your yeah. availability would be <laughs> be fitting right yeah and, and it's the same thing it's the service up mm-hmm. well go look don't mm-hmm. ask me and if you ask me i will tell you to go look because just, then then yeah. then i can use like uh, this communication that I think we forget that every time someone comes asking us for some information and we are annoyed that we're asking, mm-hmm. that we are being asked because we're being interrupted, we should think about how could I make that pull into a push. Yes, exactly. Right? I very much agree because people, I think a lot of engineers get annoyed easily about those things and you should always step back because there's always a problem in the process itself or like in the system itself. Like I was doing a lot of support on GitHub for open source projects you always get the same questions, right? If you always get the same questions, maybe you should update the error message to include more information. Like one thing we did with Fastlane was build a system where when it crashes, it will actually search on Stack Overflow through the API. And it worked, uh, sorry, I think it was Stack Overflow and GitHub actually, it was doing both. And it worked really well because people could just click on a link and see the discussion. And that worked better than somebody saying like, before you submit an issue, please make sure to use the search on GitHub. Of course, people don't do that. And I get it, like, I, I'm, doing, I'm doing the same. But if you show the error message in the right way, it helped, it helped a lot. And I think the other way, I remember, this was one of the things I remember from the Steve Jobs autobiography or biography back then, which was that there was this one engineer or designer, he was like tweaking the animations, I think, of the home screen or like the layout or something. And Steve Jobs was very particular, right, in how he wanted it. So it was always uh, nitpicking, like tiny, tiny things, right? And the engineers very soon, was like, okay, we're always going back and forth. Steve Jobs always wants me to change those numbers. So he very quickly built a tool for Steve Jobs to have like some sliders that he could play around with, right? And I remember he was like doing something like spending five minutes changing all the sliders, tweaking animations, like this is how I want it. I was like, this is pretty cool. Um, so I think it's a very good way of, for you to put it. It's like instead of, what is it, instead of a push, it's like a pull and you don't have to and waste that, more time. <clears throat> that's a very uh, genius way of doing it and a very engineering approach, right? Uh, I have done this once, and now I have to do it twice, and that's annoying. So I'll build a tool to do it instead, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, that's a very engineering-centric uh, way mm-hmm. of doing it. But one thing that we can also think about is that documentation is also a form of automation, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Because when you come me to ask me to have something happen, mm-hmm. of course it's best if the system can just do it. Mm-hmm. But we're not there yet, mm-hmm. and then I have to do it, mm-hmm. and that's annoying. But yeah. I could also just write down, document well how to do it, yeah. and give you that. And then you might need a bit more help, and mm-hmm. you know, it might have been easier for me to do it, right? But I've basically scripted you. Yes. And I think because it's boring to write documentation, at least uh, in the mm-hmm. generally underappreciated, I'd say, mm-hmm. uh, and I think there's much value to be gained there from writing better documentation, from thinking a bit more uh, yeah. about that. And I think the phrasing of saying, well, I'm actually using not uh, the public cloud, not Mechanical Turk, but I'm, I'm automating my stakeholders, right? Yes, that makes sense. And I think the topic of uh, documentation, I have two things actually to add here. One is that I agree with the whole, like, okay, writing documentation usually isn't shiny, but you can make it shiny very easily. And so one thing I really like doing, I don't know where the term comes from, but it's the readme-driven development. So the first thing I do on every repo is write the readme, at least a very rough version. So I need like a name for the project. Usually I change it later because names are always terrible they come up with. But then you actually have the usage as one of the first things. So one thing for at least the project I worked on with Fastlane was like how to create provisioning profiles. And the way Apple described it was always from their perspective. Okay, we have this database, we have this data, so this is how you should do it. What I did was like, okay, let's see how you as an iOS developer think. And like, okay, you have an app, you want to publish it, you have a code signing identity. So those are the things you want to provide to the interface. You don't want anything else. And uh, that was actually super helpful for myself because it forces yourself to, uh, forces you to think about what is the actual flow? How would you arrive on this project and how do you use it? And I think it was one of the success factors of this whole thing. So rhythmic driven development. And the second thing that I really like doing, and I don't know how often it happens, was that I build a system to actually have tests for documentation. So what I did is, for example, with Fastlane, it's Fastlane is spelled lowercase and italic in the docs, which is very specific. Usually it's not lowercase product names, but it kind of stuck like this. 
we got pull requests. Obviously, fasting was always spelled up a case. Um, but as you mentioned, it's obviously dumb for me now to spend my time to add a comment saying, like, please spell it lowercase. And sometimes people wouldn't update because they don't actually care uh, or don't have the time, obviously. And then I need to take over the PR, but then maybe they didn't sign the agreement. Like, very, very annoying. So, and also, I was the bad guy, right? Like, I had to be the one who had to invest time. Um, so, what I did is write tests. And so, the tests did a few things. One was check for some spelling that I specified or check for some potential deny words, like words you shouldn't be mentioning maybe. Uh, like, for example, everything around Apple, you might be have to be careful on like, how you phrase it. Um, like, for example, you cannot mention beta software of Apple or something. So, you had that. Um, and then the other thing is like all the code samples. It would actually see if it's valid syntax. And so for Fastlane, which is a Ruby file under hood, it would actually, uh, I have to think back now, I think it didn't actually run the Ruby configuration because that would be dangerous, running uh, third-party code on our CI. Um, but it was parsing it and checking that the action name wasn't misspelled, that the parameters are available, that the type matches, and so on. And so the beauty was somebody submitted a pull request. They got feedback from a bot. I didn't have to do anything. And it wasn't marked the screen until the tests are passing. And so also from the perspective of the contributors, I got really positive feedback because they were much more happy to update something from a bot than from a human. And my theory on that is that if it's a human, then you think, oh, Felix is just being nitpicky, like he's annoying, he wants this, this, this. If it's a bot, then it's like, okay, these are the rules, like the laws that were defined for this repo, right? So this is the laws. And they have to be followed by everybody, it doesn't matter whom. I'm not the bad guy anymore. That was like a really fun project to work on. That's very cool. <clears throat> also, um, there are so many things that I think you're just hitting many interesting notions here. Uh, but to uh, continue on the, the latest tangent, uh, there's also something, it also translates into many different things like team dynamics. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if we on our team have an agreed some ways of working, right? Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. show up on to meetings on time. Mm -hmm. Crazy, I know. We end our meetings on time. Impossible, right? A and if that's something that we can make explicit, yeah, such that I don't have to be the bad guy when I say, uh, I'm sorry, the time's up, mm -hmm. right? Because we have, there are eight people <laughs> outside the room yeah. trying to get in here, right? We have all been in that situation. But it, it just becomes awkward, and so let, let's just make it explicit, like you did with the tests. Like, mm -hmm. this is not uh, discussable, debatable, it's just the way we're doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And we all agree that in this, uh, this community, these are the, the mm -hmm. guidelines, and uh, they're written on the wall if you're in doubt. So I can just mm -hmm. point and say, we end meeting exactly. all the time. Yeah. Then it's not on me, then it's on, on the shared uh, yeah. Policing. It is a rule that's <coughs> written somewhere, but also you are not the person enforcing it necessarily, right? Because you have the system in place, be it CI, be it, I don't know, the room booking system you use yes. and stuff like that, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also very interesting, the thing you, you say about doing readme-driven development mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and making that as a forcing function to think about what is the user's mm -hmm. verbs like what are the actions that the user wants to take, mm -hmm. not uh, what are the things that your system wants to do, mm -hmm. but like doing that as an entry point because it, it can be very hard because you have such a large mental model, you know exactly what you want your system to do right. Mm -hmm. So how can you trip yourself up and cheat yourself into doing uh, taking the step back and looking into that? Yeah, and it helps you self-building it, but it also helps you long-term because you have the documentation right there. Super useful, I can highly recommend it, and it's actually really fun. And yeah, it really forces you to think like this. And you already know what you have in mind, right? And you build a new internal or external system, you already know the use case that you want to build it for. That's the beauty of, I mean, you and I work a lot on developer tools. That's the beauty of working on developer tools, because the people who are going to use our stuff are people who think very similarly to us, right? As soon as you build, like, a social media app for young people, let's just say, it's going to be very different, right? You have to do all these like interviews and conversations with potential users and have to really understand, wait, so they don't use the camera app because, we don't know, but people don't use the camera app, they use the Snapchat camera, stuff like that. For developers, I think it's um, easier if we build it for ourselves, yeah. Yes. So I think one tricky thing about building things for people that have the same profile that you do is especially for building tools that are empowering users to, to do stuff uh, is 
that you probably, even though you feel like you're in the same domain, you're actually not. Mm. Even though you might both be software engineers, you're working in different domains. And then as a developer, as a software engineer, building something for another software engineer, you probably assume much more expert knowledge on them mm. in your domain, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which can be very different, mm -hmm. even though you're both building software. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where things like uh, readme-driven development or uh, making sure you dog food uh, your own systems. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that's a very real challenge mm -hmm. in, in, in this sphere is uh, making sure that you don't assume yeah. the skill level or the proficiency or of the users or the users uh, want to be experts in your system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just want to use it. They just want they to use it, right? it. Yeah, 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 exactly. They don't care about your system. Yeah. They care about their own system. Yes. And that's why, yeah, that's why the documentation, read me, easy to understand, having videos, GIFs, as in showing the thing in action, good error messages. Good error message was the key of all, to be honest. That was a game changer. Yes. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. And so you mentioned you worked with a lot of, um, you also worked with many larger companies and stuff. And I think one thing we talked about was how you know, how can use engineer be better to, um, you know, go back to shipping if you feel stuck? Because I think every engineer, at least when you work at a larger team, a larger company, you feel like you go to this meeting, this meeting, you write this doc, but you don't actually get to build or ship anything anymore. Do you have some advice there or some experience? Yes, so, so at least one of my pet peeves is that, especially in large traditional companies, things slow down, mm -hmm. right? The concept of flow, it's non-existent, right? Mm -hmm. It's spend tons of time talking about doing rather than doing. Um, and we need to make very sure that everything is okay, everything is, uh, uh, do, uh, politics is okay, uh, we have the right check marks on our list. And, and I think we could do a bit more of, of civil disobedience as engineers. Mm -hmm. We are the experts, we know what to do. I don't need to ask anyone for permission for writing a unit test, mm -hmm. right? I don't need to ask anyone for permission for writing a small script that helps us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have somehow, as subject matter experts, as brilliant builders, shippers, automation tools, smiths, mm -hmm. we can build our own tools. Mm -hmm. We have somehow along the process, we have been taught or we have taught ourselves that to hand off too much responsibility mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for our core competencies. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that we as software engineers, we could ask a little bit less for permission mm -hmm. and just do it. What about things like, let's say you automate something, but then later you realize someone else at the same company was automating the same thing? So hopefully uh -huh. we have both brought value to the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the local ecosystem. Yeah. Because large companies, like with hundreds of thousands of engineers, mm -hmm. there are bound to be tons of duplication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's actually okay. Mm -hmm. Because we also, maybe we have learned uh, the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. right? That's the core, like we need reuse. Mm -hmm. And we can over reuse. Yeah. And like coupling by reuse, yeah. And using copy-paste as a decoupling mechanism, mm -hmm. I think is underrated. Yes, I very much agree. And, and, yeah. and like that's just, a big, but it's so, I think, I don't know if it's in the computer science programs or like in the, mm -hmm. the school of thought that have been previously, there's been so much about code reuse mm -hmm. uh, that it's very instinctual mm -hmm. to the, the average software engineer. Like we, we really want to reuse code mm -hmm. because it's waste. Yeah, I agree. I, I do think it's because we learn it in school, university, where, where we learn it because it's technically the right thing or the better thing to do, right? But I agree, like, depending on if you build, like, something smaller, be it automation or your own little side project, yes. most of the time it's totally fine to do some copy and paste of sorts or don't, like, have all these classes, but you have one large file in yes. the beginning, and that's perfectly fine, yeah. And if you create value and it then becomes a problem that mm -hmm. multiple sources create the same value, solve the problem then, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we talked a bit about build stuff that don't scale. Yeah. Because otherwise I'm not building anything. Yeah. I'm just sitting in meetings trying to coordinate with something completely unrelated to myself. Yes. How we will solve this, uh, this tiny yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, problem, right? 
Yeah. And if we just both wrote the Bash script mm -hmm. and are happy, mm -hmm. both our worlds are better and we haven't wasted anything, we have improved things. Mm -hmm. And then it's, of course, I think the, the senior technical uh, staff, whether that's uh, staff engineers, senior software engineers, whatever, they should have that organizational awareness, what is going on, what are the things that we should elevate uh, and, and promote to more, mm -hmm. more central uh, benefit. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think that's one thing, right, where people might fall into the trap you work at. You go to university, you learn that. You go to a big company, you again learn to follow the structure, the processes, right? And then you want to build a side project or your own business, right? And then suddenly you feel kind of lost because suddenly you're like, wait, I don't have that support network that's there. I actually spent all this time setting up this very complicated tooling, right? In reality, it would have been enough to have a single <laughs> like PHP or Ruby file or something, and that would be perfectly fine, right? Yes. Because it turns out your side project doesn't have 10,000 visitors every minute, right? You don't need the same scale that you need at your day job. Um, it's kind of like two different worlds, right? Yes, and I think like one of the things is that in the side projects, but it's also getting back into the habit of building and shipping stuff. Mm, yeah. right? Whether it's just uh, getting to main and share your code with the team often, or hopefully mm -hmm. it's shipping to something mm -hmm. where the, the code and the systems comes alive. Mm -hmm. Doing that often, like reducing our batch sizes, iterate small, mm -hmm. get feedback. It hurts, but it's important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think we need to, to reclaim that shipping yeah. Yeah. Uh, capability, even though we're in large organizations, or even though we're doing tons of stuff, as, a, as an industry, as a professional software engineers, I think it's so much more satisfying when we're able to ship all the time. And not only satisfying, but it's probably better for your product and your yes. idea, because you get early feedback, right? Like one example, you ship something very small, and you immediately get responses, right? People yes. saying, Either you get no responses, that's also feedback, right? <laughs> or you get questions, or there's some curiosity there, or you get literal stuff like, hey, this is amazing, I want, like, what's next? Like, what are you going to do? And I think that's so important. Like, also with all the projects I've worked on, I try to follow this, like, building public mentality. So depending on the project and depending on the context, I release stuff, or be it just screenshots or screen videos maybe as early as possible. Like even the How is Felix project we talked in the beginning, in the beginning it was Where is Felix and it was just my travel schedule. Then it was the mood, then it was the weight, and now suddenly it's everything. And I think that's also one example where it just grew naturally. I never planned on building something this big, right, or this complex in the beginning. I mean, even now it's not complex, it's a static file really, but um, yeah, keep it simple and get feedback early. Thank you for, for sharing this time with me. It's been an excellent conversation. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, thank you.